What are the three most common questions I get about generative AI in the cloud? Hey everybody, welcome to the Cloud Insider. Well, you hear about the reality of cloud computing and the expanding use of generative AI. I am your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, cloud computing thought leader, tech exec, and B-list geek. Let's start the discussion. So this video kind of came about from lots of questions that I get around the use of generative AI in the cloud and what's kind of changed in the past year or so. Generative AI wasn't a thing a few years ago, if you you know just kind of remember back and suddenly it just came on as this technology that everybody needed and everybody had to have. And you know here we are in 2024 on the cusp of lots of generative AI systems being built, lots of businesses interested in the value that generative AI can bring to their particular businesses and the problem domains and the value it's able to bring back to the business. So you're getting a lot of questions, or I'm getting a lot of questions in terms of how do you use this technology effectively, specifically how you use this technology specific in the cloud. And so here are the three most common questions I get and the answers to those questions. So the first one, is the cloud always the best platform for generative AI systems and data? No, it's not. I've uh, emphasized this a bunch of times on this video cast and in my blog and on my podcast that ultimately, this is about finding the appropriate platform for the use cases that you're trying to solve. And sometimes that's going to be the cloud, sometimes it's not. And the case of generative AI, it's a bit of a monkey wrench because we need so much processing power, so much data storage, which is very expensive in the cloud that sometimes it's hard to justify the use of cloud versus some of the on-premise systems. However, cloud computing, public cloud providers specifically bring lots of stuff to the table. And the fact of the matter is they provide the generative AI systems the tools and technologies that you need to build and deploy these systems. So they're much more convenient to use. In other words, I don't have to go off and buy uh, hardware and set it up in a data center and hire people to maintain it and deal with the headaches of power outages and all those sorts of things. I just trust a cloud provider to provide me the storage that I need, the generative AI systems to run my generative AI uh, applications on, uh, the ability to have training data stored on the cloud-based systems. And it's just more easier to use. However, the reality is that if these systems are going to be really kind of expensive as we think they're going to be, then that's not always going to be the case. And the other thing is, is that the training data uh, normally is pre-existing. So in other words, it exists now and most of the time it's not in the cloud. So we have to figure out how we're going to leverage that data effectively, integrate with those various systems, or migrate that data into the cloud, which in, our, in some instances duplicate the data, which is almost never a good idea. So this becomes another layer of architectural complexity in the fact that we have to make a honest assessment of what the needs are for, and the use cases are to build and deploy these systems and the platforms that are going to provide the most optimized value that comes back to the business. Keep coming back to that, but that really is the key indicator. It's not that we can't build these systems. We can make it work on premise and make it work in the cloud or even between the two. Uh, mobile computing, edge computing, all of those can be hosts for generative AI systems, but you're looking for the one that provides the best bang for the buck. And also considering the stakes that are on hand right now, the fact of the matter is generative AI is going to be at least three to four times as expensive as, as its traditional counterparts. When you look at the storage and the compute and special processors that are needed like GPUs, that your ability to select the most optimized platform is going to be a critical success factor for your being successful with the generative AI systems. So it doesn't have to be in the cloud. There's a reason to put it in the cloud, um, but you have to look at the cost trade-offs in doing so versus leaving it on premise or even running it on uh, other uh, types of systems, either a co-location provider, um, a cloud, ser a cloud service provider, or, uh, you know, people who do managed services uh, and provide, in essence, are able to manage systems on your behalf or you know, something in between. We're gonna see lots of new micro clouds that emerge out of this need for generative AI that are gonna provide just uh, generative AI services. In many instances, those may be the best bang for the buck, not running it on a more brand name traditional cloud provider, but a micro cloud that is able to provide just the generative AI storage services and able to probably do so at a lower cost point. Lots of considerations coming up. You should keep an open mind about all this, but cloud is not always going to be the slam dunk when as to where you're going to place your generative AI systems. Kind of keep that in mind. Next would be, what are the core differences between designing and building a generative AI system uh, in the cloud 
and more traditional ones. Uh, so in other words, if we're going to build a generative AI system in the cloud or on-premise, what's the difference between you know the more traditional systems that we're building? I guess it's the systems we've, we've done two years ago, typical transaction systems, BI, business intelligence systems, things like that. So what are the core changes that occur if we're going to use generative AI technology? And you got to remember that's going to be all over the place. What that is is going to differ from platform to platform, from domain to domain, and your use cases for it are going to differ as well. So this is going to be a general answer to that question. Well, first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be more cost. So in other words, we're going to be charging, uh, or the cost uh, barrier here is going to be significant. Um, Generative AI systems need a lot of processors that are very expensive, sometimes specialized processors, even quantum computing, GPU-based systems, um, you know, NVIDIA-based processors, and that's that's all the rage right now. And even if you consume those processors in the cloud and consume that storage in the cloud, that's still going to be very expensive. They're going to make you pay per use of those systems, and generative AI systems burn a lot of cycles and take a lot of specialized processes and store a lot of data, either training data that it needs to use to generate the new systems or the outcome data after it does the inferences, basically as it answers the questions, it needs to be outputted. And that's going to be very variable. So it's going to be very expensive. And that's kind of the core thing going in there. We know that. So it's just uh, really kind of table stakes that this is going to be very expensive, at least three times as much. Uh, but it, again, your uh, cost is going to vary based on your use case, what platforms you're using, things like that. It's definitely going to be more complex. Uh, so the idea that we can put a generative AI system in a silo, the training data and the output data is associated with that silo, and that's all that remains, that's not going to happen. The training data, certainly the data that exists within the enterprise, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be on-premise in a traditional systems, legacy systems in many instances. And so we need to accommodate the use of that data. And so in many instances, we're going to be communicating within the cloud, within legacy systems, uh, perhaps systems we built 20 years ago, systems we built 20 months ago, and some things we built in the cloud, and make all these things really kind of work and play well together. Generative AI is typically going to be a complex distributed system if you look at the pattern. So there's no way getting around that. The majority of use cases that I see out there call for that. That doesn't mean you can't take a more simplistic uh, approach to leveraging generative AI, but that's going to be the issue that complexity is really going to come into play. There's going to be more data. Uh, at the end of the day, this is going to be a data problem more than anything else. We have to consider the utilization of the training data and how we're going to use that either in its present format, say transactional data, sales data, or how are we going to manipulate and change the data so it's able to train the models better um, by, in essence, making another copy of the data and uh, providing a uh, an abstraction of those systems, things like that, and where the data is going to come from, where it exists, how are we going to deal with the output data? In many instances, uh, that's going to change over time. In other words, it's its ability to take lots of information, data that it's finding in the systems, building large language models, and then the in building the models and the ability to answer the questions that are put forth to it. And I just see this as being a data-intensive, uh, complex um, beast uh, at the end of the day for most of the use cases. Again, some of the use cases aren't going to have as much data as others, but this is going to be a lot more data that we're dealing with, which is leads to expense, leads to uh, more data planning. And in many instances, data is a huge mess within enterprises. So this may be a good time where you get in there and clean the data up and you know have a single source of truth and uh, you know, data normalization, all these things that have been put, you know, putting off for years. I think that if you're going to use generative AI effectively, in many instances, those things need to be cleaned up first if you're, you know, just doing proper architecture. And then plan for scalable cloud resources to accommodate varying workloads and data processes on demand, either again in the cloud or on premise. And so in many instances, the ability to scale these things up. Uh, is going to be the most difficult thing to do. Um, Why well, scalability has always been a strength of cloud computing and uh, we can build scalability into the architecture and into these systems. Your ability to, in essence, uh, build these and move these forward is going to be ultimately something that is going to be a common system that you're going to, or, or a common um, problem that you're going to have to solve. So in other words, how do we make these things scale? Of course, the easy answer is we're going to put it into the cloud, turn on auto scaling, and it's going to allocate the processors and data and storage that we need to make it scale up. That's fine, and that's going to work just fine. However, that's going to be very expensive. 
uh, if we're going to do it that way, because in essence, we're leaving and delegating the utilization of those resources to a cloud provider, and it's going to use the automation just perfectly fine the way you pre-program it, but it's going to use a lot of resources to make it happen. So the demand and scalability for these systems is going to be the big change that's moving forward. And so um, our ability to architect to scale, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, is going to be a key differentiator in the market. I, I see the scalability aspect of this is something that people are going to miss a lot uh, because you have to do a great deal of planning to build scalability into an architecture and understand platform decisions and also make the cost trade-offs. Like I said, we can always solve this problem by throwing money at it. Uh, however, that's not on the table anymore because if you throw lots of money at this problem and you overspend and you go to a more under-optimized uh, uh, under state, we're not going to be re returning as much value back to the business. That's going to be a problem. And the, the most common question that I get is, how? what do I need to do to become a legitimate generative AI designer and developer? Uh, and so architect, all those sorts of things. In other words, what do I need to do to participate in the boom around generative AI to uplift my career, to understand different, uh, the use of the technology? You know, where do I get into it? Is it an operational state? Is it a design state? Is it a developer state? engineering state, all of the above. The reality is there's, um, if you're good at programming now, uh, you'll be good at programming generative AI systems. Not a lot's gonna change and your ability to leverage generative AI even through the programming capabilities. So you're generating code that you don't need to write and things like that is gonna be a core skill. In other words, understanding how generative AI is gonna change your job as a developer. If you're a good architect now, and you're a good architect building cloud-based systems, enterprise architecture, things like that, the, the patterns that we know are coming with generative AI are going to be known. Again, it's going to be very intensive on data. It's very intensive on architectural scalability, making platforms decisions, platform optimization, the ability to have common control planes, the ability to build complex distributed systems. So if you're not good at that, if you get good at that, that's the generative AI skills that you're going to need to take your career to the next level. And ultimately, you know, this is about looking at where the technology is moving and what changes are taking place and then aligning your skill sets to those. So there's uh, generative AI architecture courses and you know, I have some courses out on LinkedIn Learning. Um, those are fine to do, but you know, become a self learner, try the stuff yourself. Some of the uh, uh, training that's out there are early days in the generative AI market. You gotta remember this is, you know, it's been a thing for about a year. It hasn't been a thing for about 10 years. And so just make a strategic decision in terms of what training planning you need and what you need to do to enhance your existing skill sets to move into this technology. Uh, the other thing we need to prep for is how we're going to hire the talent we need. So in other words, we want to become the talent, but we also want to hire the right talent to take our enterprises to the next level and using this technology and getting value of this technology. Um, within the amount of value that's able to brought back from the business from utilizing generative AI. This is game changing. So in other words, uh, businesses' ability to use this technology strategically is going to create a tremendous amount of value for them, whether they're making tires or a pharmaceutical company or a bank. The ability to understand where this technology needs to be applied in the right use cases, in other words, right uses of this system, where it's going to provide the best bang for the buck, where they can create innovative differentiators in the marketplace is going to be what's going to be measured success and failure over the next five years. So this is their ability to, in essence, make a strategic plan as to where they're going to move to leverage generative AI and how they're going to get the talent and how they're going to acquire the appropriate technology in the cloud or not uh, to take their businesses to the next level. So exciting stuff coming forward. I think I'm, I'm really happy that I'm in the industry right now that I'm in and really happy that I'm focused on generative AI and how it's utilized in the cloud. Um, so anyway, like and subscribe, uh, comment below, um, you know, set that bell icon so you get it notified when I have new videos out there. Let me know what you think. Let me know what topics you want me to cover and I'll see you next time. Cheers.